Hi gang, I'm Phil again, joined today by Jordan. Jordan's an ex-soldier turned author, which is why we're interviewing him today. Jordan, thanks for joining us. Good to see you, Scalzi, mate. Yeah, I was going to say, normally we have a chat on a Sunday morning at football, so it's a bit of a different environment yeah, yeah. today. Um, so, 2017, what an unbelievable year for yourself, personally. Yeah, it's been, uh, you know, it's, it's been a bit of a whirlwind, you know, so much going on at the moment. Yeah. Uh, both from a sort of personal and a professional perspective. Um, obviously, just brought the book out, which is which is uh, obviously the, the, the sort of what, what I'm, a lot of my focus is on at the moment. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's been a crazy year. Um, there's so much going on at the moment. And then there's various charity projects. We've got the Chennai Six guys who we've, we've obviously got yeah. them out of jail in the end. Yeah. <laughs> Which is amazing. Um, for those that don't know, Jordan's book, Citadel, has just gone from strength to strength to strength. When you wrote it, did you ever imagine it would take off the way it has? No, not at all, no. And you know, it's... Uh, it took three years to write as well, and, and actually, it's it, you know the book. It's about my personal life and my personal journey, but intertwined into this this sort of pirate story. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been I've been sort of working in this um, what, what we call counter piracy industry um, for the last eight nine years or so now, uh, dealing with Somali pirates and helping people protect themselves against them, big big shipping container yeah. ships and things. Um, so yeah, I, I couldn't imagine that it'd be so successful. Um, it's it's it just. I think good timing. I think Christmas is a good time to bring a book out. Yeah. Um, I've always been a big passionate networker, both uh, in person and on the social media side. So I think this day and age, the social media is huge, and you know that the, the blogging, the posts. Um, I, th I think that gives you a lot of advantage if you embrace that. Oh uh, yeah, massively. I was going to say I had a cheeky look on Amazon before we started today. The amount of five star reviews is just unbelievable for for a book. People that didn't know anything about maritime security and the way it works, just what a read they were saying. So yeah, it's nice. You know, I love the feedback. It's um, feedback's the only way you can improve and, uh, and yeah. things, isn't it? So yeah, we, we I just got to keep pushing it, and while we've got momentum and got a, got a bit of interest, I just got to keep that, and that's why things like this are always a pleasure uh, to yeah, be involved no, in. Yeah, massively. Yeah, it's a pleasure <laughs> to do it. Obviously, alongside the um, maritime book, obviously we've, you've touched on it there. The great news happened that the Chennai Six have been freed. Those that don't know the Chennai Six story, follow Jordan on social media because <laughs> he's been all over it. I didn't have a clue about it until you got talking about it, but that must be an unbelievable feeling to know that all the campaign was worth it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, these uh, just for those who don't know, six guys, uh, they they were doing the same job as me effectively for for the, for the last few years, and they ended up in um, I guess the wrong place at the wrong time on, on the wrong ship and. They encroached into the Indian territorial waters and the Indian uh, government, the authorities accused them of carrying weapons illegally. They've been sat in India for four years, the last two and a half years in jail. And we'd always maintained and campaigned that they were innocent um, and it was all above board and legal. And luckily last week, not luckily, justice uh, was done last week when the Indian government overturned the ruling and said, actually, yeah, they were innocent. There isn't enough evidence. Um, a big shame that they lost uh, four years of their life, these guys, but let's look to the future they're, they're out now in the back of the families for christmas oh, which is home for christmas must yeah, be amazing oh, incredible for incredible them. i think i'm more happy um a bit crazy but i'm more happy for the families because the torture and the turmoil that the families went through especially uh, yeah. lisa yvonne and joanne who campaigned um, you know tirelessly every day i'm just so glad for them to be back with their, their loved ones which is incredible no again obviously touching on how you got into the maritime security obviously you were a soldier before yeah. that which is how the maritime um process all came about um, your time in the army, did it prepare you for what you've seen on the maritime journey or was it even worse once you were actually involved in it? Yeah, I think um, I think definitely it, you know, aspects of it prepare you, working in uh, complex hostile environments, uh, working in small teams in remote areas, all those extra skills um, as a soldier definitely and obviously getting shot at is uh, it's something the army trains you to respond to and do. Yeah. Um, but in terms of working at sea, I don't think you can ever really prepare for working uh, on the high seas because it's just so remote, you know, in, in Iraq, Afghanistan you, you would always have uh, maybe a helicopter or you'd have backup within an hour or two. Yeah. But in the middle of the Indian Ocean you could be a week away from even speaking to somebody or seeing land, you know, it's, yeah. uh, it's such a remote place and actually um, these guys, the seafarers, the people who, 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 who bring our goods, everything we wear, we eat, you know, the TVs, the electronics, these people are literally making the world go round and it's quite a thankless task because not many people know <laughs> what they do. No. You know, more than 90% of world trade is still done on the ocean, um, which is incredible um, considering how much sort of this digital era that we're in now that still things are just done on a, on a rusty old boat sometimes. Yeah, no, I agree. Obviously, me and Jordan um, played the same football team on a Sunday morning, so I'm gonna take you back football memories now from, from an early age. I guess everyone's dream was to be a footballer. Yours no different? Yeah, absolutely. I always wanted to be a footballer. 
Um, yeah, as you say, every little boy's dream is to be a footballer and go and play for their team, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I was I was very fortunate. I had um, from my early years. I, I was picked up uh, quite early. Um, played played obviously grassroots Sunday league Saturday morning football from age of five six years old. I started at a team in Blackpool called FC Rangers. Um, was the first team I ever played for. Um, and I was picked up after a couple of years, and I went to, to Preston North End. Uh, I was at the centre of excellence there for uh, for two or three years. Uh, played at Blackpool for a year, um, and yeah, I had I had a, a really good experience. I trialled at Wimbledon, Man City, uh, unfortunately unse- unsuccessfully, um, and I'd, I'd had a, had a really good time in my sort of teens. I'd travelled America, I'd travelled Europe on football tours. Oh, I was incredible. It was re- re- really enjoyable. Well, obviously, when the football dream was over, you joined the military. And fo- but football for you still carried on within the military. What was the standard like you played within the military compared to civilian football? A massive difference, or no? I think the standard in the in, in the army, especially at army level, is you know for me it's it's as good as, as conference level football. It's in fact what you'll find in, in in the army team is a lot of players who, a bit like me, I guess that they've been at pro clubs in the pro game, yeah. uh, and they've maybe not made the cut or whatever, or, or gone off on a different path and. And in fact, you know, the, most of the army army first team when I played in sort of early two thousands were were guys who'd been at what on YTS's centre of excellences. Yeah. And actually, a lot of the people who were in the army team, uh, certainly from my experience, I was still at Salisbury City at the time while I was still in the army. And guys who were, at, you know, at older shot at Farnborough, they, they were still a, a very heavily linked with clubs. Yes. Um, and the clubs would come in as well and, 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 and try and poach, I guess, players. You know, I, I see some players this year from the army team went, uh, have left the army and gone to play for Bristol Road, right, Bristol yeah. City, yeah. You know, so oh, the standard was is of a high quality and obviously these, the guys are fit every day because that's what they're trying to do as soldiers. Yeah, no, massively. Um, obviously then, moving forward, um, you left the army and then was it, football-wise, back to civilian football? Was the come down massive or was it not as bad as what you thought it was in relation to the, what your performances and the level that you were playing at? I think, I think you know, playing on a Sunday morning uh, down down here in Hampshire, Wiltshire, certainly yeah. the standard's not not what it was at army level. Um, it's it's grassroots football for me as, a, as an adult now talking, I guess, at, at 34, 35 years old. Um, it's about the social side, it's about enjoying it, it's about getting yourself out of bed in the morning Playing it, hopefully bagging a few goals, and then getting down the pub and watching the footy again. That's yeah. what that's what it's been about for me after the army. But um, you know, for for gra- grassroots is a massive part, and I think that's you know it's something that we as a country and as a nation need to invest heavier in because that's why you see the teams like the Spanish and the Germans are incredible because they've got structures in place from you know from five six years old that can that can develop these these guys. Yeah, obviously hung up your boots now. We'll touch on that in a bit, but you're still involved with with grassroots football. Obviously, your company sponsors us on a Sunday morning, which is an amazing thing to do, giving something back to grassroots football. Um, do you wish more companies and more businesses would get involved in projects like that and help grassroots out? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it's you know uh, for me it's an absolute pleasure and an honour to, to to sponsor you guys because. Um, you're all good lads, and you're and actually without sponsorship these days, you can't play football with all the referees' fees, pitch no. fees, kits. It's you know. So for me, if you can give something back to the community, um, and a lot of those, a lot of the businesses, the community are their customers. So why not give something back? Yeah. Um, As you say, the cost of amateur football now is horrendous. With the average home game costing near a hundred pounds to fund a home game, it's just and like you say, without help, football at grassroots will just die. Which Absolutely. Would be Massive shame. Oh, absolutely, and not only not only without um, sponsorship and, and money, but people like yourselves um, and, and and the committees and the management staff. Because actually, one of the sort of uh, overlooked areas for me, I always thought over the years, was the volunteers. You yeah. know, running a football club is like running a company. Uh, the amount of problems you have with people, with money, it's it's yeah. no different than running a business. Um, and actually, a lot of credit has to go to to the volunteers and pe- people like yourselves because uh, you're the guys that make it happen ultimately. Yeah, but I say it comes hand in hand because without again guys like yourself, we couldn't do our job. So yeah, it's like, yeah. it's like a, a a marriage made type uh, of thing. Absolutely. So one needs the other. So again, but still involved in obviously in football. Obviously, by your accent, Jordan's a proud Lancastrian. <laughs> I'm still involved in football in and around the Blackpool area. Yeah, yeah. So I'm. I've just actually. Um, I've just been. Uh, um, 
asked if I would be an ambassador for Blackpool Football Club for their uh, veterans programme for 2018. And they've got a, an excellent initiative which is using uh, the, the football club, the town um, and sport and bringing veterans who are in their elder years together, uh, whether not just to play football but to watch it, to talk about it, to have a coffee morning about it um, and, and using the football club uh, to make that happen which is uh, it's a quite a, a, an exciting project. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to getting involved and a, a lot of my friends who uh, in and around Blackpool, you know, Fleetwood Town, AFC Fylde, uh, Blackpool Football Club and they're all clubs that I've been associated with in some way over the years and, and a lot of my friends are there as staff, coaches, players and what have you still, so I'm, you know, I, I try and support the local uh, teams where I come from, every time I go up there I'll go and watch one of them. Well, two subjects you've touched on there, first of all your beloved Blackpool, up for sale. <laughs> up um, for sale, we, yeah. I, we, we saw your Facebook video pretty much as soon as the news happened, I bet you're over the moon when this out actually goes through. Yeah, I am, I'm, you know, it was, it's was. it been a tough time um, the last few years, being a Blackpool fan from going, uh, you know, to being in the Premier League, you know, the dream, the, the, the dream come true, to finding ourselves against all odds with Ian Holloway, he was, he was a legend and it still will always have a place yeah. in our heart as Blackpool fans, um, you know, the likes of Charlie, Adam and, and co, um, that give us that dream season. Um, and then to being right down in the bottom tier of professional football a couple of years later was uh, for me and well for most Blackpool fans it wasn't acceptable not to to reinvest that sort of 90 million parachute payment and then yeah. expect nobody to, to say anything um, it's incredible I, you know not I don't go to home games at the moment like a lot of Blackpool fans are part of the uh, not a penny more campaign yeah. um, uh, and that's why I, I, that's why a lot of Blackpool fans actually they go to Fleetwood, they go to AFC Fylde and support the other teams, and only travel to Blackpool away games. Yeah. Um, the, the club's going up for sale. Valeri Belikan, um, the Latvian shareholder, he's, he's won his court case against the the Oyston family, um, which I'm, I'm sure there'll be a few more twists and turns in that. Yeah, I, I don't think it's that clear cut, but the club's up for sale. So so uh, if there's any Russian billionaires out there, we, we, we welcome you <laughs> to come along. Vegas of the north. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then the other one you touched on, AFC Fylde. Good timing. Obviously, we're filming this on a Tuesday afternoon. They play in the FA Cup. They're replaying against Wigan this evening. Yeah, it's, it's an oh, the AFC file guys. An incredible setup there. I've been up there a couple of times this year. Um, I got a few friends who are playing there in the first team still, and oh, they, they've just had such a whirlwind. You know, last eight to ten years from it, almost almost a Sunday league football club yeah. going all the way through. Um, uh, you know, from grassroots all the way to verging on the pro game, and they've got the setup they've got there in terms of infrastructure, the stadium, the coaches, the management. Um, it's incredible. It's you know, it's as good as as, as any League One club. Um, uh, you know, moving up to the Championship. Never mind in the Conference. Um, big game tonight against Wigan, obviously. Tough game. Tough game uh, away as well. Um, but you know, you, it's the FA Cup, and as they say, the magic of the magic. FA Cup. You never know, do don't, you? Don't exactly that. And what a dream it would be to be in that third round. Oh, you know, it's incredible. Just to, you know, the, the delight just to be in the hat last week when they, they did the draw, you know, just to be in the third round draw. Um, and I think it's an away type Bournemouth, I yeah. think. Um, you know, so a Premier League away game, it's, it's. Massive character dangle. Absolutely, and I'm sure it'll probably be televised being a, you know, a conference club go, going up there. But Danny Rowe, I must mention Danny Rowe, who's, who's a friend of mine, he's a. One of the best unsigned players out, you know, outside of the, the, the professional sort yeah. of structure, if you like. Um, he's you know, 50 odd goals last season. He, his goal to game ratio is incredible, and um, he spent a lot of time. He's, from, he's a Blackpool lad. He spent a lot of time at United before before he went uh, to Fylde, and he's just banging him in for the fun of it. The guy's a goal machine, and he's uh, you know, and um, hopefully he will he'll bang him in tonight. Gonna push you. Score prediction. Oof. <laughs> You know, I'm going to go with a, I'm going to go with a cheeky one nil filed. One nil filed. One nil filed. It's a, it, maybe it's a bit ambitious, but it's the FA Cup, and this is what dreams are made of. Uh, everyone has to dream. Yeah, absolutely. Right before you end the football, a few quick fire questions. Best ground you've ever played at? Best ground I've ever played at, uh, probably the old Wembley. Um, but if you ask me where I'd always want to play, it'd always be Bloomfield Road, regardless of the problems and issues. I'd always want to play on, on as, Bloomfield Road. As you were growing up, favourite player that you idolised? Favourite player as a striker, I, I was always a big fan of Mark Hughes. I think he was sparky. He was the master of the volley, and uh, you know I'd always try to practice his technique. He was he was incredible uh, centre forward. One player, past or present, you could spend an hour with. Who would it be? Oof, good question. Oof. I think if it was a present player, I'm going to go one of each. If that's all right. Yeah. I think it was a pre if it was a present player, I'd probably go with Crouchy. I just think he's got a good banter, he's a good guy, he's up for a laugh and, and you know, I'm sure he's great on the latch as yeah. well. <laughs> the crouchy and we've pulled the robot out of him, I'm sure. Um, 
uh, uh, probably somebody like Georgie Best. You know, I, I always remember. I always remember Georgie Best because he had the talent, but he could. He was one of those guys who could also, he, he, you know. He had, obviously, it was it was um, it worked against him in the end because he, he lost his life because of it. But he was a guy who lived to the full, wasn't he? But on and off the pitch, he lived to the absolute max. the maximum. So you know, I think to have a have a have a beer with him in a bar, you know, he'd definitely be <laughs> an interesting character. That's a good one. And one last one. One bit of advice you'd give to a young footballer wanting to make it, what would it be? That's a good question as well. I think. I think the discipline is one thing I've learned in life, not just as a footballer, um, but I guess uh, if you want to do anything in life, does it, whether it's a you know whether it's a child who wants to go and play football or whether it's you wanting to go and achieve another dream um, at any stage of your life as well, not just a youngster. I think discipline is the key um, because you won't always be motivated to get out of bed and to go training maybe uh, on a match day, but if you can be disciplined, um, I think that's the big difference for me. Uh, between the players who make it and the players who don't make it. So I can remember at sort of 15, 16 years old when I was at Centre of Excellence, you know, 15, 16 as a young boy, you're in school, you start discovering, going down the park on a Friday night, yeah. the girls, all those sort of things that are distractions. And you, you, you speak to people like Gary Neville, they were the guy who was in bed at seven o'clock on a Saturday night, he'd get his protein, all his meals were squared away. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's the difference, the discipline to, and, and sacrifice as well, because you know, the good times come later if, you, if you're gonna go down that route. But I suppose the one talking about that, that everyone talks about would be Ravel Morrison. Yeah. When, when Sir Alex says he's the best midfielder I've ever had, but I can't manage him. Yeah. That, that says it all, because he's had Skulls, Beckham, Keane. Exactly. So to put him above them, but unmanageable, it's manageable. just like, where do you go from there almost? It's sign your own death warrant. Yeah, absolutely. But I think, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, discipline is so important. And I, I think sometimes as well, you have to learn yourself. You have to make the mistakes yourself. It's very easy to pass on advice, but they used to say a wise man learns from his mistakes, but an even wiser man learns from other people's. Yeah. <laughs> but right. no, good. Right. Moving on, 2018, exciting year for yourself. Obviously you hung up your boots as we touched on earlier because you're doing an amazing project, um, running dangerously. Excited, nervous, or shutting your eyes about it? <laughs> yeah, a bit of, a, a, bit, a bit of all of the above, I think. Um, running dangerously, for those who, uh, who don't know, it's, uh, it's a charity project. We're raising uh, funds and awareness for three charities, uh, War Child, UNICEF, and the Darlington Foundation in Somalia. Um, and essentially what I'm gonna be doing um, it's called Running Dangerously for a reason. I'm going to Iraq, Afghanistan and Somalia uh, to do a 10k, a half marathon and a marathon to, um, to, to raise, as I say, awareness and funds. It's, it's going to be tough um, and one of the reasons, as you say, I hung up my boots was because, as you know, I'm very injury prone. <laughs> I, I can't, you know, do a... I'd say a 10 metre run, but I don't do that anyway, do I on a football <laughs> pitch, but I can't go for a, uh, for a jog without getting injured with an ankle or a knee. So a lot of people have put a lot of money in to sponsor me and support me, so I think it's only fair that I show the, the discipline and the commitment to, 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 to go and do this properly. Yeah, no, definitely. How's the training going? Hard or? I think um, the training's tough. Um, I'm probably not into the full swing of it. I think I was kidding myself starting before Christmas because uh, <laughs> everyone wants to take, take you out for a beer or do a, a function or whatever. So I, I'm, I'm training. I'd go for a run every day uh, in the gym a couple of times a week and um, I'll first of January, you know, that'll be me. Then I'll be, I'll be, I'll be hitting the the road quite heavily then, and, and getting in a lot of ten uh, k's, five uh, k's, and things every every couple of days. Uh, but now, exciting times. Looking forward to it. So we've seen your training videos up at Reasons um, with Tommy and the gang out there. It looks quite intense. At times. Yeah, yeah, really good. You know, I've got Tommy, uh, who's obviously helping us at Reasons, and uh, Rick Webb Fitness, who's our official training partner. Uh, Rick's uh, an amputee who's one of the fittest guys. He, he, he puts me to shame because he's got one leg, the guy, and he's the fittest guy I've ever met, you know? It's incredible. But again, people like Rick, they're, they're, they're very inspiring people, and it's great to have uh, Rick in the team with us because he, he's trying to achieve his own things and get over his own hurdles yeah. uh, as well, which is, is, is great to support him uh, and, and vice versa. So, any other, may, may, any other massive projects coming up in 2018 for yourself, or is...? There's a, there's a few small projects. Um, I don't want to say too much at the moment because they're not over the line yet. But there's oh, a, there's a, a potential TV work, uh, documentaries and things. But um, I don't I don't want to curse them or, or jinx them. Uh, but yeah, it's an exciting year, 2018. Um, hoping to do a lot more on the veteran side. Um, I'm working on a project with uh, a place called Broughton House in Manchester. Uh, again, they've asked me to be an ambassador to, to help raise awareness for, for veterans uh, who require support after the services. Um, so trying to get in, in, involved more in, in supporting ex-military personnel, um, uh, raising lots of money for charity, and yeah, just, just, just trying to keep achieving my own goals, I guess, and objectives. 
Well, as I say, if 2018 can be better than 2017, you're going to have had one hell of a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Also, for those that would like to give any spare money they've got, we'll leave a link in the bio to Jordan's um, uh, page where you can donate money for his running. And anyone that's got any spare cash would be absolutely amazing if you could. Yeah, but, thank you. Thank you very much, much appreciated. Right, last but by no means least, we are going to give away one of Jordan's books. So here we go, here's Citadel. So, there, there's the book itself. On, so, on social media, all you have to do is like and share the post on whatever platform it's on, and in a week's time, we will pick one lucky winner at random and give you a copy of the book from Jordan. Signed as well. Signed, signed copy <laughs> of, from the man himself. Right, Jordan, I can't thank you enough for sitting down with me today. Absolute pleasure and amazing to speak to you, as always. Just before we finish, Scolzi, what I'd like to do is give you a little token of our appreciation of your great blogging and vlogging. Uh, from Blackpool, we've got uh, Mark Cullen, who was our top scorer last year. We've got his shirt here um, from the recent um, Poppy game. And he signed it for us, and I'd like to give that to you because I know you love your sporting memorabilia. Okay, thank you, John. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. Thank you very Cheers. much, and thanks for joining us. Perfect. Cheers, mate. Cheers, John.